market and uh, the amount of effort that you put in, we are not getting that much of uh, return on it. Matter was established in 1966 AD, long before tourism ministry was there, long before tourism uh, that are uh, stakeholders of tourism while making, uh, while doing any decisions on uh, that one. Before people were so happy that goods were coming there, but now if you ask the locals, they no longer like it. Yeah. And um, what to say? Before Nepal, uh, in Nepal, what we think is like um, we have, um, though the destination is expensive due to air connectivity, but the destination itself is very, uh, the price is very low. And uh, the travel agents are not earning much. Um, the hotels are not earning. Hello and welcome to nepaltraveler.com. We are back again with the next edition of Travel Trade Talk and joining me today is Ms. Yubika Bandari who is a major stakeholder. She has quite a lot of experience in the travel industry. She is very passionate about sustainability, about architecture. She is also an engineer and an architect and it will be an interesting conversation today as we talk about how these overlap into tourism. Welcome to our show Yubika. Thank you. Uh, so, Yubika ji, to start with, how did you begin your journey in tourism or what led you into tourism? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, I never had planned to enter into tourism. But my parents, they established our company in 1984. Uh, so, when I graduated from architecture, it came upon me to join my father's business. And during that time, I thought like, maybe I can try it in part-time group service. Okay. So what I, what I was doing was I was working part-time in my father's uh, office and part-time in my architecture firm. So I was balancing both the things. But later, I think um, travel and tourism is in my blood. So I opted out for completely to be in the travel industry. And today you're mm. the managing director of oh, Shashi's Holidays, yeah. which is a well-known uh, tour company travel and agency. Yeah. Um, Shashi's Holidays, like I said earlier, uh, my parents, uh, Shashi Ram Bhandari and mother, Vijay Bird and Shrestha, uh, they established the company. Um, they had a, what to say, <clears throat> I'll just give you one experience as a child. Um, in season time, my parents used to be very busy, so we didn't have much time to meet them. So three o'clock in the morning, they'll leave for the airport. Late night, they'll come back. But during um, off season, they just used to take us to different destinations. So we didn't have a say. Maybe sometimes, uh, like one incident, while um, my father said, just go inside the vehicle. I'll take you somewhere. And then we went to Dolka straight away without anything, no without any backpack, without any preparation. And then on the road, he made us sleep on, what to say, outside a very small cut cottage um, on Sukun. Okay, the mat, yes. Uh, the, the mat. Uh, and then after that, later, he took us to Cherry Coat and all. And then we came back after three nights without prep any preparation. So that was my life before. <laughs> but I guess that's the best way to travel yeah, without that's the plans. Yeah, best way to travel yeah, without plans. So, like, uh, I was fortunate enough to have parents like that who gave me so much of exposure and so much of experience in travel during my childhood. And now that you are the managing director, you are at mm -hmm. the helm of Shashi's holidays. How is that going, and how do you see the travel industry at the moment? Okay, well, that's a tough question, I suppose. Um, Shashi's holidays, like when we were doing business earlier. Um, it was fun to do the business because like we only used to concentrate on our services that we give to our guests and what products like whether that product is suitable for them or not what was the age and all and we used to get good uh, money in return profit in return you can say but nowadays um, it's a very tough competition in the market and uh, the amount of effort that you put in we are not getting that much of uh, return on it so most of the people are not seeing this as a lucrative business anymore. But at the same time, Nepal has such a 
good potential in tourism. We can, I hope we can bounce back and I think we'll bounce back. So it's not as it used to be before. That's all my take. And how important is it perhaps for us to start making better packages, saying better stories about Nepal, because mm -hmm. uh, that's how we can get people yeah, in. Yeah, that's what. Like I've always, um, uh, what to say, told my uh, colleagues in travel, like storytelling is the best way uh, to promote any product. And um, there was a session in um, the tourism board recently as well uh, that was emphasizing on storytelling. And outside uh, travel also, like um, I sometimes do research projects, like um, currently I'm doing Ruben Museum's research in Okobaha, a very fine monastery in Patan. So there we are trying to make tourism products by storytelling their culture, their social lifestyle, what's the importance of like what Nevar Buddhist um, monasteries are all about and how is it different from other uh, Buddhism uh, monasteries and other practices. So like I, I've been working on few, like last time I didn't, uh, like we couldn't complete the project, but there was a language, there's a language called Hayu okay. in Nepal. There are just 2,800 people who are speaking that language and the younger generation, they don't know it. Wow. Just the grandparents' generation, they know it. So even for that one, we're trying to revive, like we're trying to promote uh, uh, the Hayu people to speak their language and uh, to link up tourism with it so that they can retain their identity as well as get profit from that in a sustainable ma manner. So um, hopefully later uh, in days, I will be able to do that project. But right now, it's uh, we have stopped it and I'm concentrating on the Okubaha one. You're also the General Secretary of NATA, yeah. Nepal Association mm -hmm. of uh, Travel Agents. Mm -hmm. How do you see your role there? And uh, mm -hmm. just to share what kind of stuff you're doing there. Okay, um, as a Secretary General, uh, NATA, uh, NATA was, uh, I'll just give this history as well. NATA was established in 1966 AD, long before Tourism Ministry was there, long before Tourism uh, Department was there. So the pioneer uh, travel agents, they came together to form NATA so that we could help each other as well as we could help the government to formulate policies. Only in um, 1960, uh, sorry, in 1965, the department uh, registered um, tourism company. Before that, it was all informal uh, companies. And then um, even my father uh, was um, vice president in NATO in previous uh, years. He has passed away. Uh, it has been uh, more than 10 years now. And um, this is my third term in NATO. So what uh, we are emphasizing is like after COVID, uh, that's when I uh, entered came NATO, in. came in NATO. Uh, there was a infl uh, like the manpower, the skilled manpower were no longer there when the uh, things That's lockdown true. opened because most of them either they went abroad or they shifted the industry. So during that time, our main focus was to give them training, to train new people and uh, to retain the staff so that they could um, earn their living in this industry. So we tied up with Nepal Tourism Board and UNDP to give that kind of projects. And after that, uh, we have been, um, or to say, lobbying um, for our like uh, tourism-friendly policies. We usually go to ministers, uh, parliamentarian, if we think like uh, something needs to be done. And um, even now we are working in policy, uh, act and policy of uh, tourism, and we are working together with the government. Hopefully they listen to us. Usually what happens is like we give them our suggestions, but that never comes into light. It that's takes a long sense. time for it to long be action. Long time or they just, uh, what to say, they forget about it altogether. And uh, that's the sad part about it. Like uh, our government, they don't listen to the stakeholders that are uh, stakeholders of tourism while making, uh, while doing any decisions on uh, that one. Like uh, recent, uh, I think three years back, the government rolled out um, a not so tourism friendly policy uh, regarding the uh, paid up capital and all. So when we lobbied, then they, uh, it went to the cabinet of our Bagmati province and they had to take it back. So we are doing that kind of uh, things mostly. And um, during the last time, I used to be the training coordinator of NATA as well, uh, tour training and heritage coordinator. So we trained around 800 people. Some were work-based training, some were for the capacity in all seven provinces of Nepal uh, to build the manpower. And right now, uh, like for the recent flood that we see, now, uh, right now we again have a crisis and emergency response committee as well. 
that looks after all these things. Like what we saw um, uh, our industry was lacking was we are not proactive. Like when earthquake happened, when other riots happened, we were always defending ourselves. We didn't think previously that if this thing will happen, how will the uh, coordination be? Uh, okay. we, we were just doing whatever comes in our path. So we have to break that. We have to be, um, we have to be prepared beforehand if anything happens. So now NATA is also concentrating on that one, like how we can be prepared to face all these things. Um, that's what we're doing. And you were mentioning the, the Tourism Act, that some of the changes. Yeah. What are some of the points that would help NATA, would help uh, travel agents mm -hmm. actually do better or and as a destination, help Nepal as a destination? Oh, there, um, to help Nepal as a destination, government should have, uh, the first and foremost is infrastructure, but that's not there in the tourism the policy. So that's the must for uh, tourism. Uh, good roads, good connectivity, uh, better uh, airports uh, with good connection with the outside world. Um, that's the must. And after that is like how we can um, incentivize, like if we are making a new destination, how to plan it. Like what we are doing is like, few hotels will come up in a destination and we call it a new destination. That's not That's how smart. things should be because you should have a health post, at least a health post, uh, uh, security wise, a police station should be there, hospitals should be there and um, proper waste management system, uh, proper coordination with the locals, the local communities, everything should be there and a uh, destination should be managed first and foremost, then only we can call it a product. What we are doing now is like we are just, if a um, few hotels or small hotels comes up or uh, there is a very nice, uh, what is it, new waterfall that we have discovered recently, then we call it a destination. We call it a destination. It's not how it should be. So, so basically, I think mm, what we would be suggesting is to have a basic checklist. Yeah. At least these points should, should be, be there, there before we yeah. call it a destination. That's why like uh, right now, um, uh, we are promoting to few, um, what is the international uh, um, consultants as well uh, to make a product for destination um, or to say uh, in a holistic way so that we can replicate that in other parts as well. So NATO is also working on that one, how we can uh, promote, like uh, I'll just give you an example of Bhumati. Bhumati, like in our uh, travel company, we used to market as, as uh, what to say, the traditional uh, lifestyle of living in a city. Uh, the Bhumati used to be, a, a, what to say, tourists used to love that uh, place. Yes. And uh, you could see like uh, just ducks running around and people doing their regular uh, like things in a traditional way. And then it started to lose its charms once the bus park was there, once the local like haphazard uh, new construction came out. So we no longer could sell that product, even in the valley. So uh, in the last two years, uh, UN Habitat, they even consulted with NATA. What they did was like this made storytelling books of the festivals there, of the temples there. I myself used to travel there so much, but I myself didn't know that Mankamana was there in Bhangmati, which opens um, only twice a year yeah. when the main Mankamana temple is closed during the Shaya. Okay. So it's in the valley, but um, even like I thought that I knew so much about <laughs> the destinations, but I also didn't know about that. So what they did was they put on the signages, they made a small museum to explain what are there. So uh, they tried to uh, make again, like revive that destination by giving them a proper, a proper digital presence. The website was uh, very good. Um, the books were very good. The stories were very good. Uh, so they tried to make it holistic. So that's the way we should go, but still, because of the bus park and the new uh, new uh, construction, uh, it's, it, it still doesn't, uh, what to say, has regained its old charm. Old charm. Yeah, that's the, but this is the same, I think, happening up in Jomsom. It's happening across yeah, the country. This modernization. modernization. Suddenly, we're just building roads mm -hmm. without any plan. Yeah. Uh, like when, when I went to Jomsom, like pe before, people were so happy that roads were coming there. But now if you ask the locals, they no longer it's like killed. it. Yeah. It's killed all the business, it's killed that yeah. charm that was that there. charm is no longer there. It's no longer, like we used to, uh, it used to be a longer duration trek. So all those destinations would have guests. Now, no. straight away go to Muktinath, or straight yeah. away go to Upper Mustang in a vehicle. And that's not the right way to do it as well. Because like uh, when I went to Tilicho, uh, I could see young, uh, uh, young Nepali uh, guys and girls 
uh, what they did was they took a bike ride via Manang and straight away may, uh, went to a destination and then they just had, uh, what to say, one night at um, base camp and the next day they were trying to trek to the Tilicho Lake but their body couldn't do that because we are not, not acclimatized with the altitude. So this is not the right way to go because like for us in Kathmandu, we are in, we, we, are, we live in a higher altitude but for other guests, they come from a sea, uh, like a sea level, sea yeah. level altitude. So um, if like we promote it that way, then lots of casualties might come. They won't enjoy the journey. And um, though the destination is good, once the journey is not good, then they don't, they, they they don't won't come recommend back. it either. They, they won't recommend, recommend, yeah. And the destination itself will be killed. So that's a very wrong way to do it. And I can see like in Rara as well, like one of my neighbor, uh, he died, he passed away. Because they went there straight away, they didn't have, uh, the, the body wasn't acclimatized. And what we do, we drink okay. when yeah, we are trekking. Yes. So like uh, for domestic tourism also, we should think about those things before promoting or before venturing out into any destination. You touched on domestic yeah. tourism. And domestic tourism has suddenly grown in yeah. Nepal, actually more so mm. after COVID. Yeah. After, uh, we can say more so after earthquake. Even after the earthquake. Yeah, after and the earthquake. Uh, how does Nata, oh, as a mm. traveling, how do you see this uh, Nepalese traveling? Because there's pros and cons. Yeah. Nepalese traveling, yes, it, it mm. gives some impetus to the industry. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, there's also a lot of challenges when yeah. Nepalese travel there. <laughs> uh, what I see is like, uh, if you look around the world, um, domestic tourists are the main uh, tourists. Driver, uh, if you go to China, if you go to India or other destinations in Asia, domestic tourists are the uh, main, or to say, the people who give business, business. to the industry. In Nepal, we didn't have that one because like uh, like you uh, said, uh, after earthquake, what I felt was like uh, people, they no longer thought like we were invincible, we were immortal. So, and they didn't uh, thought so much about saving money and they wanted to travel. Yeah, travel. They wanted to experience in their lifetime because the life was uncertain after that. And then uh, for any destination to develop, what I think is, or what Nara thinks is like domestic tourism is a must. Sometimes infrastructure won't be perfect, but we are, um, or to say, we can adjust to those things because we are used to it. And slowly we can develop that even better. That's the thing. But, however, uh, one thing is we, Nepalese, as a tourist, should learn like what we should do at the destination. We should respect their culture. It's not always fun to be like, uh, in, I, I'll just give you one example in um, Anupuna region. Um, my guest, he didn't prefer to stay in the main location because there was a group of uh, domestic tourists who were singing and dancing and drinking all night round. So we had to shift him to a very secluded place so that he could have a nice sleep, quiet, uh, quiet exactly. uh, place. So uh, those uh, people who go to the mountain, they are looking for quiet and serene uh, kind of an atmosphere. but. Um, what we are doing now, uh, what I say domestic tourists are doing now is like we are not respecting the um, and, uh, the whole ecosystem, I can say. Uh, so we should be a little bit uh, sensible on that case. We should be sensible on littering. You can see all the plastics on the road. If you see a foreigner traveling that route, they will pick up yeah. litter of others. Uh, what my guides do is like we, uh, what we promote is our guides will always have a Bag right. for That's garbage. Right. So whenever they are uh, trekking, they are guiding our guests. They'll pick up those things, and then at the end of the uh, trek, they'll give it to the right. um, authorities. To dispose, yeah, yes. to dispose of. Uh, so we, as a Nepalese, uh, should always uh, think like we should respect nature. We should mis respect the culture. We should respect that place where we are traveling. Do you think that perhaps the tourism board or other organizations yeah. like yours, Nata, and others? Mm -hmm need to be educating also the domestic traveler because... Yeah, we should, I think we should look into that now. Because right now our general members, they are usually um, either ticketing agents or tour agents. Uh, that's our members uh, in NADA. So uh, tours can be inbound and outbound. Okay. And that always, uh, outbound caters to the um, our general, uh, domestic tourists. And um, the inbound would be foreigner. So we are just looking around those things. Maybe now for domestic also, we should have some strategies because 
after all, like um, we have a very small and very uh, potential destination and everybody should travel, but we should travel respectfully. Mm -hmm. You've also been as an architect, mm -hmm. as an engineer, uh, passionately involved in uh, sustainability, mm -hmm. in uh, heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to share some experiences, some of your views on, because we suddenly have a lot of hotels coming up. Yeah. And uh, one concern mm -hmm. is, are we I heritage and that. is that being maintained mm -hmm. or, or will that become another city with just big hotels? Yeah, uh, like we talked earlier, um, Dwarika is a very good example. When we incorporate heritage in our architecture, what benefits a hotel can get? They never compromise on their price. There's no need for them because they are a standalone kind of a property because of their uh, richness in um, the architecture, the, in traditional architecture, and they uh, concentrate on the services. But the new um, chain hotels that are coming up, uh, I don't see much of the heritage thing being uh, there. And uh, a hotel in Kathmandu is similar to the hotel in other cities or other countries. So we are not getting that uh, Nepalese USPs uh, in those hotels um, infrastructure. They sh uh, like our suggestion is like we should always incorporate what the um, local traditional architecture is there. Like if I give an example of Gandhra, um Gandhra looks very nice because uh, the um, nowadays due to road has lost its yeah, yeah. There's some things have happened. But uh, if you look at the architecture, if you look at the beauty of it, the old architectural style is still retained in the villages. Yeah. Uh, so that gives us charm that that is what the tourists are there to uh, come and visit and that is suitable for that uh, area as well uh, right now uh, in Kathmandu as well if you go in a um, cemented building in summer you'll feel hot and winter you'll feel cold but if you go and live in a traditional building it's just the opposite uh, the um, air inside is always at the right temperature uh, so like when I was after I studied architecture and when I was doing part-time in tourism, I also taught. And my topic was um, history of architecture as well as passive solar architecture. And that is like how you can integrate um, local materials to make a building uh, livable uh, with a very good environment. So what kind of, uh, where should the windows face, how thick should the walls be and and what like, materials to yeah, use? What also. materials to use? What colors to use? So everything is there in architecture. But here, what's happening is like we don't consult architects so much by building a building. We are just there to make a plan, and nothing uh, is uh, what to say. At least in residential properties, uh, people don't follow it as it should be. And then um, we are making a um, society where we will require external. Uh, elements like ACs and fans to cool us down. So that's what's happening. So if you look at the traditional architecture, we should always learn like what was best in it. Maybe the space was not so much. Maybe the walls were thick. Maybe we can um, change those things and then make it better. Uh, have you been to Neva Chain in Patan? Uh, when I was studying architecture, I think it was in 2000, 2001 2000, or 2000. UNESCO uh, had built um, first um, bed and breakfast property. They helped to build a bed and breakfast property in Patan. Uh, it's near Sota. And that can be an example, like how a traditional architecture can give you the charm of the tradition, as well as how the modern amenities can be incorporated in it to make it livable for the present day society. And also, I believe uh, most of the old traditional uh, style of buildings and stuff yeah. are even more sustainable yeah. in terms of environment and probably even economically more, more sensible. Yeah, that, that's always there. In long term, you don't require anything like um, any uh, electric, much electricity is not required. Uh, and uh, when you are even what to say, the water, uh, rainwater harvesting can be incorporated biogas from your uh, restroom can be incorporated. So all those things will just lessen the operation cost of the building. And um, solar panels, all those renewable energies are also there. And as a travel agent, uh, to link these things, what kind of feedback are you getting from your DMCs, from your tour operators in terms of what the tourist wants? Because I think they are now more responsible. They're looking for yeah. more responsible travel. So they want authentic uh, Nepal. 
that's the that's the thing they might want immersive trekking before it used just to be like while going from uh, point a to point b now they want to know what is in between point a and point b what kind of uh, indigenous people are living there what are the groups are living there what's their culture so they want an immersive trekking nowadays they just don't want to trek travel just yeah, travel just travel so they want to know the locals they want to know the environment the stories behind that the myths behind that so uh, that's the need of the day and um, what to say before nepal uh, in nepal what we think is like um, we have um, though the destination is expensive due to air connectivity okay. but the destination itself is very uh, the price is not very, very low exactly. and, uh, and the travel agents are not earning much um, the hotels Hotel are not store. earning much however um, what we are still doing is like we are fighting uh, we are doing the price wars among but ourselves yes. among ourselves but what we should be looking into like nepal is competition to maybe vietnam maybe to sri lanka maybe to thailand like uh, the culture immersion that we can give you maybe the vietnamese are also giving them and they have a better infrastructure they have better connectivity so they are going there uh, for me uh, one of my agencies they transfer from uh, nepal uh, to vietnam and sri lanka okay. uh, because of the connectivity and nepal still hasn't tied up with airlines international airlines what vietnam did like it was back in i think 2010 or 9 when i was talking with my agencies there what they said like every day in their newspaper that time uh, digital was not so much but the okay. print newspaper was a thing every day they will be promoting vietnam thai airlines airways will be promoting vietnam not the vietnam com- uh, country in Thank itself you, so they have tied up with uh, thai airways so even during that time 500 euros was uh, two way travel from vietnam uh, to european country whereas to nepal it was 1500 euro and they said like this kind of promotion we are not doing and still after so many years we are still, still lacking on that front so and we have learned from those and things. is there also a big problem because our own national flight carrier has that's not been able to the fly biggest, yeah that's the biggest problem and thai airways is not the national carrier of, of vietnam, vietnam or but of they were doing this. that right so like maybe the nepalese government uh, should diversify their thinking as well like uh, maybe they are having problems with uh, nepal airlines but maybe himalayan airlines can be can used be for certain destinations maybe qatar can be used for certain destinations uh, qatar is a transit hub maybe we can have a um, nepal hub in a in a, inside the airport so that it can be promoting nepal so people traveling to other countries will come and see nepal and then they want to travel to nepal maybe we can collaborate uh, in those yeah. areas as well uh, and uh, for nepal airlines we have given so many suggestions to government if people are afraid to buy aircraft then maybe we can have a sister airlines like when thai airways was not doing good when they were in bankruptcy um they made thai smile and they continued it maybe a sister uh, ra okay. uh, something uh, nepal airlines uh, another term can be added and we can acquire that we can make it maybe into ppp maybe the public can um, um, invest as well maybe we can take out ipos for that one if the government is not able to do that maybe the tourism industry private sector can invest yeah. on that one they just have to make the mechanism for that or they can just have a committee in the existing uh, nepal airlines from private sectors from experts who are uh, who have been uh, purchasing aircrafts maybe that way we can do it so there are so many other um, ways that we can um, make uh, nepal airlines stronger but we haven't been doing it and that's what nata has been lobbying all these years as well as a final question mm-hmm. do you see unity among the travel industry i mean not our part our hands unless we all come together yeah. and actually make perhaps a common minimum plan for the government yeah. the government also will keep on avoiding all the issues uh, this is the usual yeah. everywhere what i want to add is like we have a secretary general forum of all the association most of the okay. associations so we meet regularly to share our concerns among ourselves like nata is there Pata is there, Han is there, uh, NMA is there, TAN is there. So like we and uh, NTBA is there, like you know, the vehicles are there. So we have a forum, and we meet um, maybe um, in two months one time. Or if there are issues like I said, tourism policy, then we met again. We uh, share our knowledge among ourselves, 
uh, that we do. And uh, recently, NATA also, um, uh, we held um, meetings between uh, similar kind of, um, what to say, um, associations. Uh, there were two vehicle associations, so we had a joint meeting with them to see like how we can move forward in the like, if you see like in the heritage <coughs> sites, we don't have parking, we don't have pick up and drop uh, uh, services because there's no space there. We don't uh, have toilets also. We don't have toilets, toilets uh, like uh, that is always there and we don't have a tourist bus park. That's a very sad part. So all these issues like uh, we were working together, we have made a committee, made a committee uh, between three um, associations, uh, two vehicle associations and NATA so that we can uh, help government or we ourselves can solve some of the problems. So we do collaborate among ourselves. Because I think if we all come together, we can put more pressure on the government in yeah. terms of common minimum plan. Yeah. Like this is what everyone yeah. needs. At least start with this. Um, that, that would be a very ideal situation. Like I said, though we have this forum, sometimes... Um, there is a common yeah. areas. Okay. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, so I'm done with my questions. Is there anything else that you think that uh, issues from the travel industry agents like yourself, mm -hmm. that you want our audiences to know? The main issue is infrastructure. That's the main issue. Infrastructure meaning roads airports. and airports and uh, our uh, national carrier to be strong. So that's the only thing that we want our government to do. The rest, private sectors, will find the market, will do uh, what is needful for the country. And another thing is like Nepal Tourism Board. It was made in PPP model with the main sole purpose of marketing Nepal. So they should stick with that one. They should not wander off. They should not uh, start building infrastructures. That's not the job That's of Nepal job. Tourism Board. Exactly. For the last few years, they have been doing that. So they should concentrate more on how to market and promote Nepal. And other agencies should look into how to build a better infrastructure for tourism. And the rest, private sectors can do. That's what we think. Thank mm. you so much, ma'am, for taking the time to speak to us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Terence, for having me.